Well, good morning, everyone. To our guests and friends this morning, welcome to Oasis Community Church. My name is David, and I have the honor and privilege of sharing a message this morning from the Word of God. If you'd like to hear the message this morning, it will be translated into Spanish, or if you'd like to use the Bible, our ushers, they have a hearing device for you, or they have a Bible in English or in Spanish. Buenos días y bienvenido a la Casa de Dios. Mi nombre es David, y en esta mañana el mensaje será transmitido en español. Si usted desea escuchar el mensaje, los sugieres le pueden dar una de las maquinarias para oír el mensaje, o si quieren una Biblia, también ellos tienen eso disponible. Well, it's good to be back. I'm so glad to be here again this morning. Um, I was gone for a couple of weeks, not because anybody upset me and I didn't want to be here. It wasn't for that. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go and visit our son in Indiana where he's studying, and we got to spend some time with him. And then last week, uh, I was here, but not here. I was uh, actually visiting L.A. Community Church. Many of you remember uh, A.J. McLeod, the young man who came and spoke a couple times here. And um, they had asked me if I would come and speak there, so that's where I was last Sunday. Was able to be with them, praise God. I was able to be with them and to fellowship with them, and what a beautiful church and what a beautiful group of people. And you know, family, I'm going to put on your hearts to be praying for L.A. Community because they are going through the struggle that we went through. Uh, their lead pastor also has been called away. So uh, many of us remember the pains and struggles on that first uh, few months and year that we went through when our pastor uh, had been called away. So there's some, some pain that's happening there. So let's be praying for L.A. Community Church. Let's be lifting them up and, and asking God to bring that group together to be able to use those individuals there for his honor and for his glory um, in a mighty way there. But they're a beautiful group of people. But there's nothing like being home. I'm glad to be here. Glad to see all of you. And so you don't have to call. You can call back to the search and rescue team. It's all right. We're good. No problem there. But I, uh, I'm glad to be here. And um, I'm also glad to be in, and honored because my um, bigger sister is here. So it's your first time. I have to say, I have to say bigger sister because if I say older, that might offend her, even though she is older. But So I'm, I'm glad that she and her family are here this morning with us. This morning we're going to be looking at um, an Old Testament book, the book of Hosea. And um, you know, um, a few years back when I was young, younger, younger, okay, my father gave me a car. Daddy gave me a 1977 Cutlass Supreme. And um, it wasn't a new car. We weren't blessed that way. In fact, I don't think my father ever owned a new car. So it was a used, used car when he gave it to me. But yet it was beautiful. I love that Supreme. Oh, I loved it. She was beautiful. I'm telling you, that was my baby. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a guy... 19, 20 years old, this is his first car. She was gorgeous. She was black, jet black color. The interior was black. And she had these big chrome bumpers. Not like today with a little strip, right? I mean, these are big chrome bumpers. L ladies, if you want to check your makeup, all right, and that thing was just clean and polished just right, it was like, no compact mirror, just look at the bumper, you can get yourself fixed up. Be careful, though, because if the sun hit it just right, it could blind you. I mean, it was just, had these big rims on it shiny rims. I just loved my Supreme. And it had a great stereo system. I mean, the speakers, you could hear it from a mile away. And I put that to use. Okay? Just, I loved my Supreme. And for a car of that year, it had all of the latest options. I mean, it had automatic transmission. It had power steering, power brakes, air conditioning, power windows, power door locks. Now, some of you are saying, that's standard. It is today, but it wasn't back then, right? If you wanted power brakes, it was right here, right? And the power steering was right here. That's, that's the way it was. So this, it was beautiful. I mean, I just loved my car. I loved this baby. It was just... And so I, I would just spend hours washing, waxing, and polishing, and just taking care of my baby. And you know, my... I live with my parents, and we lived like the distance from here to the corner of Heacock and Alessandro 
from our front door and where the, uh, the market was, the grocery store. And every now and then, my mom and dad would say, Mew, can you go get something at the store? Or can I said, sure. An opportunity to get in the car, right? So I get in my car, and it was about a 20-mile trip <laughs> because I just wanted to drive my car. I mean, I just right, turn that radio up. How you doing, you know? <laughs> hey, you played the game too. Don't act like you didn't. You all did, all right? God was there. He saw you. <laughs> Ladies, don't say, well, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. <laughs> did you see how he looked at me? <laughs> yeah. You know, it may not have been in 77 that you played your game in. For some of you, it may have been your brand new Ford Model T, right? <laughs> but... Or maybe it was like Jack. Maybe you rode up on your horse. Howdy, ma'am. <laughs> hey, let me just make sure you know Jack knew I was going to say something. He's on vacation, but he knew I was going to say that. But if you guys want to edit that from the tape, I'm good with that too. <laughs> but I loved my car. I loved it. I loved it. And every Saturday, as it become my custom, I would spend literally five or six hours washing, waxing, and polishing my baby. Weekend after weekend after weekend. And one Saturday, my mom, our house, uh, the washing and dryer was in the garage, and my mom had been doing laundry and doing things. And one Saturday, she walks out and she goes, Mijo, be careful. I said, be careful. I looked at the cars. I thought maybe I missed a spot. She said, Can't have that. She said, be careful. I said, Mom, what do you mean be careful? She said, your car, it's becoming an idol to you. Be careful you don't replace God with a car. And you know, throughout the history of mankind, that's what we have done. We have taken things or people, relationships, something else, and we've placed it in the place of God. God's people, the Israelites, throughout their history, that's what they did. Over and over again, after being in a fellowship with God, being in a relationship with God, they would allow things to come into their lives and they would drift and put something else in place of God Almighty. The story we're going to read about this morning is the story about the life and time in the Israelites that that exact same thing happened and how God is trying to reach out to his people. Here at Oasis, we're accustomed to standing when we read a God out of reverence for his word. So if you're able to, would you please stand as we read scripture from chapter 1 of the book of Hosea. Starting at verse number 2, the word of God says, When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife, and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Delibium, and she conceived a son, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Go, or call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, for I, am no long, for I no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to each one of us. You know our needs. You know who we are. You know everything, Father. So let your spirit have its way here today as we hear from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. What a strange story, right? 
mean, it's kind of a weird story when you read that. E even by today's wicked standards, the story of this man marrying this woman and all this adulterous stuff and all this, it's, it's kind of icky. And I don't even know if icky is a word, but it just kind of gives that feeling, right? What is God saying? What is God trying to communicate to his people? You see, God was trying to demonstrate through this story his faithfulness and his people's unfaithfulness. God was trying to demonstrate his consistent love and their rejection of his love. God was trying to show them how far they had gone away from the relationship that he wanted to have with his people. Um, this man, Hosea, is a, is, is a prophet. And so think about that, right? I mean, for those of us who are married or we know someone's going to be married, this is an exciting time in the life of someone who's going to get married. I mean, God tells them, Jose, you're going to get married. Yes. Thank you, Lord. I've been thinking about that. I, I, but I was waiting. So now, Lord, you're giving me the, good, the green light. I'm going to go out and start looking. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to go down to the river and see how the women are washing around their uh, robes, right? See if they've got strong arms. Got to get the barbecue stains out of the robe. See if they can carry that pail of water. They have good balance, strong backs. Those are qualities that guys look for in those days. Today, maybe a little different, right? But he's thinking, I'm going to go out and look. And God says, no, it's, it's prearranged. Wow. Think about that, fellas. It's prearranged. Don't have to go through that dance. Don't got to go through that game. And if you like me, check yes. If you don't, check no. <laughs> None of those things. No eHarmony, right? No ChristianSingle.org. I mean... Good job. He's ready to go. So it's exciting. This is an exciting time. When you're going to get married or when you've, you're around people that are going to get married, that there's just this love and this happiness and the joy and everything is perfect. And when, when a man finds this woman, I mean, she's, she's perfect. There's nothing that can, she can do or say that will upset him. Everything she does, perfect. The way she eats, how much she eats, the way she dresses, Makeup, no makeup. I mean, she is perfect. And the world is right. And then you start thinking about this. And even for us who, who are around people who have just recently got married or are going to get married, it even elevates our joy and our happiness for our spouses. It's just a wonderful time. And then you start thinking about the projection of a, a wedding. And it's going to be a perfect wedding. It's going to be 74.2 degrees that day. <laughs> It won't be a cloud in the sky. The flowers are going to be blooming, even though it's the dead of winter. It's just going to be perfect. The kids are going to behave themselves. The whole family is going to get together. There'll be no fighting. Everything's going to be great. Fellas, even the mother-in-law is not going to get you upset, okay? <laughs> Everything's going to be perfect. So he's thinking, I'm going to marry this woman. It's going to be great. And God says, it's prearranged. Wow. Thank you, Lord, because you know what I need. You are so good. Can't wait to meet her, God. Who is she? It's Gomer. Gomer. Gomer? <laughs> God, I know you know everything, but Gomer? You see, Gomer was the woman who would go to the well at the noon hour when nobody would go to the well. So it was the hottest part of the day, and she was embarrassed of her lifestyle. Gomer was the woman who would come down the road and people would go the other way because he didn't want to be around her. She was an outcast. Gomer was a woman that all the guys knew, but none would claim her. Gomer was a prostitute. And how is it that God is picking this for his servant? Strange. But you see, God was showing them in a real vivid and public way how he viewed the relationship between him and his people. How he was faithful and they were not. How he was loving and they rejected it. How he was kind and compassionate and providing and they sought after other things. That's the picture that he was showing here. Over and over again throughout the life of the Israelites, that's exactly what they did. We read that over and over again after they had spent time with God and had built this relationship, they would allow other things to come in distract them, and they would drift away. Look at the text in Exodus chapter 6, 
verse 6 and 7. It says, Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is God speaking to Moses to tell the Israelites. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. We know the story. And if you read this text, there's twice that God says at the beginning and at the end, I am. It's about God. He lets them know off the bat, it's about me. I am. I am all you've ever needed. I am what you need, and I am all you're ever going to need. I am. I am everything. I am all there is. And in between that, he says all he is going to do. He said, I'm going to take you out from where you are, your bondage, you're, you're in chains, you're slaves. I'm going to take you out from that. I'm going to crush your enemies. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to be your God. It's all about God. He doesn't say to them, look, I want to be your God, but you're going to have to do some things. You're going to have to do this, or you're going to have to work this hard, or you're going to have to... No. They don't have to do anything. He's not saying, look, I, I want to be your God, but you know... You got to put your left foot in and take your left foot out. You got to do a little hokey pokey. No, it's all about him. And we read the story about the, the people, the Israelites. They're in just bondage. The Egyptians have them. And if you read that, you get to sense and you know that they were treated worse than the horses and animals of the Egyptians. They were under heavy bondage, being killed. And God is going to take his people out of that situation and take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. God, throughout that story, he crushes every one of the Egyptians' gods. Just decimates them. Takes his people out. He's going to take them to a place where he's going to be their God. They're going to have a relationship with him. And after a short period of time, what do they do? They create a golden image and they start worshiping another god. I mean, even the Egyptians at one point, as God is just crushing them, they say, you know what? Go. Your God is greater than all our gods together. It's almost like they're more obedient than God's people. Go. Follow your God. He's right. Here, take the gold. Take the silver. Take everything we have and go and follow and be with your God. Your God is greater. Your God is better. Your God will provide all you need, but just go. And they do that. And after a short period of time, they make a golden calf and they leave God. Time and time again, they do that. We read in the book of Jeremiah, at one point, and it's almost sad when you read this, God says, For my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless gods, and they have stumbled for, from their ways. From ancient past to walk on byways, not on highways. You kind of get a sense that God's hurt. He's sad. He says, my people, my people, those who pledge themselves to me, those whom I have called, those who said that they are going to follow me and love me and, and be with me, they've forgotten me. They, they've drifted and gone to do other things. They're, they're worshiping other gods, gods who have eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear their prayers, hands and feet but can't do anything for them, mouths but can't speak to them. And they're worshiping that instead of me, the Almighty, the Creator of the heavens and the universe, the great I Am. And they've left the path that I have placed them on. I've made a way for them. I have a plan and a purpose for my people, and yet they go down these rabbit trails. They go and search in areas that they shouldn't be in, areas where they're going to get hurt, areas where they're going to fall down, areas where they're going to be subject to attacks from the enemy. My people, who were called by my name, have forgotten me. Later on in Jeremiah, you hear the Lord, and he says this, The Lord appeared to us in past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. You see, God doesn't relent. He doesn't give up. He doesn't quit. 
he continues to seek after his people. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't give up on his people. No matter how far we think we can go, God is right there. He's trying to draw us back. He's trying to bring us back into that relationship. All God wants is that personal, intimate relationship between his people and him, between you and him. And he continues to show his love. And he says, I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. I'm trying to reach out to you with everlasting kindness. I love you. That's awesome. And so in this story, again, God in a real public way is trying to show the people how far they have gone and how faithful he has been. And we read these names of these kids, I mean, these strange names, right? Although if we were living in those times and we would say, well, here's my son Tim and my daughter Sally and little Johnny, they'd say, well, well, some weird names there, right? But these names have a meaning. They have this first child named Jezreel. And see, the picture that God was trying to show them in the meaning of Jezreel is that God sows. That's what Jezreel means. God sows or God scatters. And so God was telling them that because you have rejected me, you will be scattered among the nations. Agriculture was very big in those days, and so everyone knew about that. And so the picture that God wanted them to see was of a farmer. When he'd go out into the land to, to plant seeds, he would have a sack of, of seeds by his side. And there'd be a hole in the top. And the farmer would reach into that bag of seeds, and he'd take out a handful of seeds, and he'd scatter them across the land. And he would do that over and over and over again until there were no more seeds in the sack. What God was saying is that because you have rejected me, you will be scattered among the nations. This next child, Loruhama, God is saying to this child, the name is not loved or not wanted. And what God was saying is because you've rejected me, you will be scattered. And because you've rejected my love, you will not be loved. You will go out looking for other things to fill that void. You will go out searching after other gods. You will go look and worship other idols but you will not be loved because you have rejected my love. You'll be looking for love in all the wrong places and you ain't gonna find it. That's what God was saying. And then you have this last child, this last son, Lo Ami. And this one means not my people or not belonging. And so God was saying, you've rejected me, you'll be scattered. You've rejected my love and you will not find love. And no matter where you go, you will not find that you belong. You'll be wandering. You won't find a home. You'll all have the sense of emptiness and not belonging somewhere because you have rejected me. What a powerful way God was trying to reach out to his people and let them know how far they had gone. Let them know how far they have drifted away from where he was, where he wanted them to be where he would care for them and love them and, and build this relationship and shower blessings on them. But his people continue to drift. Now what's interesting is that in the same way that these children's names have a meaning, so does Gomer. See, Gomer means complete or perfect. You say, well, wait a minute. I mean, here's a lady who's got some issues. I mean, she had a pretty bad past to begin with. And she meets this guy who's good and decent and probably is going to provide for her. And, and she goes off and runs to be in the arms of other people and, or other men and has these kids out of these adulterous affairs. And her name means perfect? How is that? How could her name mean complete when she was nothing but the opposite? She was always doing all these crazy things, being unfaithful to her husband. The answer to that is not in her name, but in the meaning of his name. See, Hosea means God delivers. And so the picture is that when God is in the picture, he delivers. When God is in the picture, he restores. When God is in the picture, what is lacking is added. When God is in the picture, what is wrong is made right. When God delivers, things are complete and perfect. Do you see how that works? You see how God is trying to reach out to them and how God's trying to reach out to us today. Because you see, we're some messed up folks in this room. Starting right here. 
We have done things, said things. We have placed other things in front of God. We have sinned. But when we come to know Jesus Christ, when we come to accept Jesus Christ, his blood comes and washes all our sins away, makes us right. And when God the Father looks at us, he doesn't see a messed up person. He sees his perfect son, Jesus Christ, in us. That's the message that God is trying to reach out to his people then and even today. God loves each and every one of us. He loves this world and he wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to be perfect and complete in him. Not because of us. Never happened. But because of Jesus Christ. Because he left all the splendor of heaven to come live a simple life. Live a sinless life. And give his life on the cross. Pay the price for us. To take our shame, our guilt, our sin on him. And to clothe us in his righteousness, his goodness, his love. And in him we are made perfect. So what about us today? What have we allowed to come into our relationship with the Lord? What things have we maybe placed a higher priority on? You see, God doesn't want to be number one on the list. God wants to be the list, the one and only. He wants to be the first thing you think about in the morning and the last one you talk to at night. He wants to be the one that throughout the day as we have these struggles, because we do, that we go to him and say, Lord, help me with this. Not for us to go and find opinions of other people and see how this group might think about it or that person might think about it. He wants us to be dedicated solely to him to spend our time with him, to seek him, to love him, to build that relationship with him. Because in the end, he is all that matters. Heaven and earth will pass away. God is all that matters in our lives. I put a 77 Cutlass Supreme before God. Piece of metal. It looked nice at the time, but still a piece of metal. What do we put before God today? Maybe you don't know Jesus and you felt that your life is scattered or that you don't belong or that you don't feel that love. Today, Jesus is telling you, I love you. I love you so much that I gave my life for you. Or maybe some of us who know Jesus have allowed some things to get into our lives that maybe have pulled us away, that maybe we've just kind of drifted off. God is saying, hey, I am chasing after you. I'm pursuing you. I love you with an unfailing love. I want to shower blessings on you. I want my intimate time with you. See, God's not going to compete. He'll let us go and do our thing. But he's right there. And he's constantly reminding us and trying to draw our attention back to him. He's constantly every day blessing us and wanting us to come back and meet him where he's at. He wants to have that relationship so that he could use us for his honor, and for his glory, for his name's sake, for him to be magnified wherever we go so that the name of Jesus is proclaimed. So let me ask you, how are you doing? Where are you at today? Jesus is calling you back. He loves you with an unfailing love. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are consistent. Thank you that you never fail, that you never waver, you never change. Thank you that from the very beginning, before we were born, you knew us and you wanted to have that relationship with us. Thank you for this time of being here today, for allowing us to worship you. Thank you for your word this morning. Spirit of God, search us today. Search us and, and reveal to us those areas in our life that maybe we have, have drifted, that maybe we have allowed to take a higher priority than it should. Father, I pray for your forgiveness. If there's something that is in, within me or within us, Lord, that, that isn't right, that we have, have lost our focus. Today, let us refocus on you because it is about you 
You are the great God, the awesome God, the loving God, the bright and morning star, the counselor. You are a redeemer, our lover of our souls. You are the great physician. You're the forgiver of our sins. The restorer of our lives. Where there is no hope, you come and bring hope. Where there is bondage, you break the bondage. You restore in a mighty and a powerful way for your honor, for your glory. Lord, I pray that if there's any here today who don't know you, maybe they've been visiting, maybe they've heard about you, but they haven't made that commitment to you, Jesus, that today be the day. If there's some of us who have drifted, Lord, I pray that we come back to you, rededicate ourselves, and that we seek you like never before, that we bring you honor and glory. Lord, I pray you be glorified and you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.